I suspect some of you came to see what's up with the funny title here. I must say, I've never had a title this long before. Um, and I hope by the end of this, I can help convey where I'm going with all of these different things. I get thinking about sustainable forest management and everything that enters into it and how it's a moving target um, over time. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about seven things uh, this afternoon. Um, first, I want to take you to New Brunswick a little bit and just talk a little bit about the New Brunswick forests and forestry there and some of the research needs just to provide a little bit of context for what comes. Second, I want to consider sustainable forest management, some definitions and how it's, how it's changed over time and how it's still changing. And then I want to talk about four specific research topics that I think impinge upon this. And one of them is insects, all the work I've done with spruce podworm, both the impacts on forest production as one um, topic of interest, but also how it's a natural disturbance and what can we learn about the ecology of, of it as a natural disturbance. Um, the second thing, totally different topic, is carbon in forest and in forest products in it and emissions from forest operations. We've had a big project going on on that. The third one is around kind of intensive forest management and zoning approaches and, and the term triad that's been used as a mix of intensive, extensive and, and protected areas across the, the land base. And the fourth is, a, is an ongoing experimental manipulation study that we've got going in New Brunswick looking at how you can manipulate intensively managed spruce plantations during a commercial thinning operation um, to increase their conservation value. And then I want to end up with just talking a little bit about effective university industry collaboration or it could be university government collaboration as well. Okay, so New Brunswick, just Google Earth, of course, uh, all of Canada. We're out here in Alberta right now, New Brunswick on the East Coast, up against the Atlantic Ocean. Um, lots of forest in New Brunswick. And I just zoomed in on, on three or four different places there just to give you a, a picture. New Brunswick's been settled for a long time, and the forest has been picked over for a long time. There's a lot of private land. That's one thing that's different from, from out here. Um, and if you look at different places, there's a real strong footprint of recent forestry in some places and there's less of a footprint in some other places where the forest looks, at least from, from this level, um, pretty well intact. Um, and we see different patterns that emerge from this. The right side of the, of the slide here is part of Fundy National Park that's not picked over at all. And then the road network and, and some different treatments, including some little circular patch cuts, if you can see them. Um, or some of Irving's operations next to that. Okay, so New Brunswick is 85% forested, so it's important. Uh, but one thing that's different is it's 50% crown forest, and the other is 30% is private woodlots, which apart from New Brunswick and a little bit of Quebec is quite different than the rest of, of Canada, and it's 20% industrial free old. And somewhere in that mix, there's about 2% federal land as well, with Canadian Forces Base, Gagetown, and a couple of, of national parks. So, so that's one thing, it's a different ownership pattern. It's about two-thirds softwood um, evergreen species and about one-third hardwood deciduous species. And, and the species are really diverse because we get the mixture of the, of the boreal kind of spruce and birch and, and, uh, and fir with all the hardwoods from the, for the northern hardwood species. So if we look at the, at the species mix, it's 36% spruce and we get red spruce as well as white and black and 19% balsam fir. And this 55% currently compares with an estimated 54% in the 1938 uh, forest inventory, 54% and 61% in 1958. So it hasn't changed a lot in terms of that composition. And then we get into all the other species. There's about 5% each of, of cedar and jack pine and, and white pine, 8% red maple, 7% sugar maple, 5% each of white birch and poplar, 4% yellow birch. These tolerant hardwoods are some of the really high value and interesting species, uh, sugar maple and yellow birch. And 4% total on a whole range of other species, hemlock, red pine, beech, larch, oak, butternut, ash, and, and elm. So it's complicated. There's a diversity there. Uh, the age class distribution, most of it's pretty young, 0 to 20 years old or 61 to 80 years old. There's these two age classes with sort of a gap in between. About 40% is less than 40 years old, and about half of that is planted or spaced. So there's an intensity of management that, especially in this younger regenerating forest, that's different from most of the, of the rest, or rest of Canada. 4% is currently, of the Crown land, is currently set aside as, as protected, permanently protected, legislative protected areas. It's in the process of growing to 8%. The other areas have all been identified, they just haven't been, been claimed yet. 
26% of the area is allocated for habitat or, or stream buffer purposes rather than, than forest production. Doesn't mean you can't do any cutting in them, but it's restricted what you can do. Um, and there's a range of natural disturbances, both stand replacing and, and gap replacing. And the map shows the, the, the general occurrence of, uh, of natural disturbance types where the, the green, um, sort of the, the gr dark, darker green areas over here are uh, stand replacing. Um, the darker blue are primarily gap replacing. The lighter blue are a mix of, of gap stand and the, and the lighter green are a mix of, of, uh, of, of uh, stand gap. Uh, where the stand replacing is primarily spruce budworm, some fire in some areas. Um, the gap replacing tends to be old age, disease, wind throw. Um, and this, there's a movement of trying to move in this direction um, in terms of what kind of harvesting goes on, whether stand replacing is more like a clear cut or a variable retention. Um, and then there's certain stand types where it really doesn't make any sense to clear cut them at all and it's legislated that you can't. Okay, f in terms of forestry, importance of forestry, I guess the the, uh, it's the highest per capita forest products export in Canada. Um, so wood and paper products are more than 30% of manufacturing. Uh, the largest exporting sector in the, in the province, uh, largest economic sector at 3.5% of GDP. These numbers would have been higher a few years ago, sort of before the downturn. And tied in with that is the point that we, we can do things to increase forest productivity. But on the other hand, forests are more than just economic production. They're more than just wood products. There's habitat and conservation and biodiversity and, and water and a whole variety of other values. So how do we balance these, these two things? So the question arises, can intensive forest management exist while maintaining the integrity of ecosystems? Uh, the criticism is often that, that planted stands are sanitized with less structural diversity, fewer species, and less downed and, and standing deadwood. So what are the influences of that? Uh, Okay, switch to my second topic here, sustainable forest management. What is it? Well, I Google a definition, of course, and I've got three of them here for you. So the UN Forum on Forests says, a, a concept that aims to maintain and enhance economic, social, and environmental value of all types of forests for the benefit of present and future generations. FAO says, aims to, main, to ensure that the goods and services derived from the forest meet present day needs while at the same time securing their continued availability and contribution to long-term development. Slightly different, but some consistent themes. Canadian Council of Forest Ministers says, manage forests as ecosystems to maintain their natural processes and recognition that forests provide a wide range of environmental, economic, and social benefits. So there's certainly some common themes across there, and it's economic benefits, yes, but also environmental and social and maintenance through, through the future so that we're not destroying things today um, that won't be there for the, for the future. So when I got thinking about this topic and, and, the, and the way it changed, it, it took me back to soon after I moved to the University of New Brunswick. Um, I was teaching a forest policy course in the year 2000. In, in trying to talk about the people side of forestry, I invited um, Joe O'Neill, who was a, a retired, recently retired at that point, Vice President of Woodlands for Repat Paper in the Miramichi. Um, to come in and talk to my class, and he, and he called it people stuff in forestry. And, and I thought that there were, there were four points out of this which kind of stuck with me, and I went and dug them up, and I wanted to repeat them to you today. And remember, th this is circa 2000, and he talked about old forestry, which to him was 1985. He said old forestry was simple. The concerns were pulp, logs, fire, and safety. Um, and, and what you did to produce those things, well, you did planning and protection, and you built roads, and you grew trees, and you cut trees, you transported them, and you did some performance audits. 1985. And then by 2000, the list had gotten a whole lot longer, in his, in his view. And it was competitiveness, and quality, and costs, and productivity, and consistency, and growth, and innovation, and partnerships, and ecosystems, and sustainable, and biodiversity, and habitats, and the National Forest Strategy, and roundtables. He was actively involved with the National Roundtable for the Environment and the Economy, so he threw that in. Public participation, ISO 14000, certification, audits, accountability, credibility, image, codes of practice, stewardship. And he said, what is new forestry? Less for fiber, more for other values that sustain life on the planet. Habitat, carbon, sink, water, medicines, other ecosystem benefits, Mother Earth. Now remember, 2000, so we're 13 years on from, 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 this, uh, from this now. And depending upon where you are, you could add other things to this list that have either arisen since 2000 or else are specific to the area. There's nothing on here about caribou. There's nothing on here about CBFA. 
Uh, there's nothing on here about mountain pine beetle. There's also a bunch of or uh, uh, cumulative effects kind of in the Alberta uh, context. Uh, third thing Joe talked about was, was well, people challenges. Um, and at that point in time, he set, figured that the, the biggest people challenge was clear cutting. That urban, rural, and most forestry people prefer the look of a non-clear cut. But 90 to 95 percent of the harvesting is done by clear cutting. And, and he, looking ahead, figured that in 10 years from 2000, there'd be a 50 percent reduction. And in 25 years, clear cutting would be only one system with partial harvesting systems being primary. And it's certainly moving in that direction in New Brunswick, but probably not a 50 percent reduction. Um, yet. He said that the second people challenge was credibility and trust, misinformation, public fear, society's changing values. And the third one is kind of specific to New Brunswick, the private woodlot sector, overcutting, low silviculture levels, no incentive for silviculture that was there. Um, the third point that, that Joe made was what he called the urban scorekeeper. It's the person who's living in, in downtown Edmonton and knows little about forests. And he contrasted sort of between hell for that person and heaven for that person. And hell was traffic, no space, cement, pollution, stress, two parents work and meet in the hallway, single mothers, children and seniors at risk, crime, uncertainty, exhausted, rushed, anxious, responsible, over budget. And heaven for that person from their perspective was renewal, relaxation, peace and quiet, change, things with life, things that grow, nature unspoiled. Plants and flowers, trees, shrubs, frogs, bugs, people who laugh, a quiet place, a place to walk, an old tree, birds, wildlife, a brook, a pond, a sound in the woods. And he made the point that that's where foresters work. Okay, so there's this dichotomy of perception of what the forest is and, 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 and how it changes over time. But I think the term, the urban, urban scorekeeper, um, is kind of interesting, uh, sort of who, who if, if it's a public forest, where is most of the public? And then the last point that Joe made was, OK, tools for new forestry. If, if we're moving ahead, what do we need to do? Honesty, credibility, trust, communication skills, help people relate to what we're doing, research and facts, inform stakeholders, effective public involvement, forward-thinking leaders, adaptive management skills, a user pay philosophy, proof of, proof of performance, continuous improvement, technology, knowledge, skills, decision making. And he said, lastly, checkpoints in decision making, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, profitability, and then healthy ecosystems and healthy communities, including, including the people that rely on our forests. So again, remember, kind of 2000, just kind of forward thinking for the, for the time, but I think some of it still applies, uh, applies today. So, and, and to me, it relates to the, what sustainable forest management is and how it's changing over time change my color scheme, change my topic here. So I've got four of these, four different color schemes. But number one, understanding stand dynamics of, uh, under, uh, underpins effective sustainable forest management. And to me, this is stand dynamics with and without natural disturbances. So this sustainable forest management balance should include the maintenance of natural processes, habitats, and populations, conservation and protected natural areas, because if we don't do that, there are going to be some pieces that are just going to fall by the wayside with the regular management that goes on. Climate change is a, is a big question now, because everything's changing in front of us. Ecosystem goods and services, as well as timber, recreation, and habitat value. So is there room in here for intensive forest management? Um, a forest zoning approach to increase the flow of certain values from certain areas? Uh, and I'm going to address that later. Uh, but learning, research and questions and experiments and monitoring what's going on so as we, as we learn over time are, are part of this. And I, I'm going to talk, I spent a lot of time working with Spruce Budworm I and mean, it's, it's our major forest disturbance in my forest as opposed to maybe fire being here. So I'm going to talk about it. So it's a defoliating insect that repeatedly year after year removes part of the current year foliage from the, from the trees and this reduces the stem growth of trees by about 90%. Uh, the, uh, the different bars on here just show patterns of growth before an outbreak starts with, uh, with the yellow line and, and uh, sort of with different stand densities, but there's about a 90% reduction. And then after the defoliation ceases, if the tree isn't dead by then, it's going to continue to grow. But, to grow. but a lot of them die. Um, and it depends on the species and it depends on the age. But the, the kind of rule of thumb that has been borne out across multiple outbreaks for our types of forest is expect about 85% mortality of its old balsam fir. 
expect about 35 to 40 percent if it's old spruce or if it's young fir and maybe 10 percent, 13 percent if it's if it's young spruce. So there's differences among species there, but there's a, a strong effect on the on the forest. That's that's one factor. We've had a lot of area of spruce budworm outbreaks in the past. So this is the moderate to severe defoliation in New Brunswick from 1945 on the on the left to 1995 on on the right. And two two outbreaks here. Our scale is up to four million hectares. New Brunswick is about seven and a half million hectares, just to give you a perspective. This is 1975 up here. The red is the severe defoliation. The, the yellow is moderate. The green is, is light. And almost all of the province is covered at the peak of that, of that outbreak. So there have been two discrete outbreaks going on here. It, it looks like they merged together, but there were areas that had at least 10 years of no defoliation in between the two outbreaks, and then some other areas where it seemed to persist in here. So the extent of coverage is part of the reason that it's of concern. Um, and the uh, even though there's been no defoliation since 1993, there's been continued work on, on this system. Uh, but now it's popping up again, not in New Brunswick yet, but in Quebec. Um, and it was increasing so since about 2005, it was at low levels, and then from 2008 to 2011, it's been a doubling about every year, and it's up to about 2.4 million hectares of, of defoliation in Quebec north of the, of the St. Lawrence River primarily here. In, in 2012, it's into the gas bay south of the St. Lawrence, which is right next to New Brunswick, of course. Um, New Brunswick does, the provincial government does pheromone trapping to determine the population trends. And it's below defoliation level. The trend has been upward everywhere, and it's been upward to relatively high levels in the northwestern part that's right adjacent to the gas bay. So it seems like an outbreak is coming. It's not there yet. Probably won't be this summer, maybe the, maybe the summer after. Um, so this has led to this, this effort to develop decision support systems. The decisions around budworm are whether you salvage, whether you're going to do anything, whether you elect to spray insecticides or not. It would be BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, primarily now. There's a mimic as an as a insect growth regulator. Chemicals like DDT or phenytrothion or Matacil are no longer uh, registered or, or available. They won't be used. So this is just a, a computerized system that tries to project for every stand polygon in the inventory. So this is just a GIS layer. The color is the volume loss if a particular pattern of butter milk break happens. Uh, uh, and so the, the losses are high in the pink and hot pink areas, and, the, and they're low in the blue areas. So if you're going to do anything, it kind of directs you to where you would do it. And it allows some, some exploration of costs and benefits and sensitivity and effects on annual allowable cut. And a, and all of that stuff. It, it's been implemented for all forest in New Brunswick twice, two different times, updated. Um, it's been tested in Alberta. It was used in Saskatchewan with their spray programs. It's been tested in Ontario and Quebec, and it's been implemented in Maine for all of the state of Maine. There's ongoing projects in Manitoba and, and Nova Scotia and, and Newfoundland. And, and just to give you a feel for what's involved with it, essentially we're taking stands and we're growing them over time, volume over time. And if a budworm outbreak happens, and we calculate an alternative growth pattern if they're, if they're defoliated. And we calculate the difference between those values, and that's essentially what's mapped. This gets built up into a big lookup table in terms of the mean percentage volume reduction as a function of the host species, the, the host age, whether it's managed or not, um, time, five-year periods, and the defoliation scenario, which can be input by the... So once we've built that stand impact matrix, this big lookup table, then we can go to the forest inventory and we can input volume yield curves over time for different categories of stands that would be influenced by budworm. We can input a defoliation scenario or multiple scenarios for different areas, and go to this stand impact matrix to calculate the volume reductions, wrap this all up either in a uh, Woodstock uh, timber supply model or a Microsoft Access Geo database, and use it to project these alternative yield curves with budworm. It's like with, without budworm or with budworm, or with spraying insecticide or without spraying insecticide. The curves move. On, and then map that back on the, on the land base to calculate the, the volume impact for future time periods. So this has been expanded to a couple of other insects, balsam fir softfly and, and hemlock blooper, uh, work done by PhD student Javed Iqbal, who's working out here in uh, Edmonton now. Uh, but it it's becomes a us usable tool. Um, so if we take those values from that system and apply them to New Brunswick, now here I've gone with just a, a single color. So the deeper the red, the higher the losses. 
And I mentioned there's lots of spruce fir in New Brunswick. There's five million hectares out of the seven and a half, um, and there's lots of red. And we can add up the values for all those polygons, and a projection of an outbreak like what happened in the 1980s in New Brunswick results in a potential loss of 82 million cubic meters of, of spruce fir timber. And if we up that, make it just a little bit worse, a severe outbreak scenario, which is like what happened on Cape Breton Island, and that's just two more years at the peak. It go, jumps from 82 million cubic meters to 203 million cubic meters. So there's a lot of stands that are right on the edge, a little bit more defoliation, and you, and you tip them over. So again, this becomes something that's useful if a provincial government is trying to decide why they should spend $10 million on a spray program or not, or what the consequences would be, or what's going to happen with annual allowable cut for a crown license there. Um, and I want to show some of those numbers for, the, for crown pr productivity in, in New Brunswick right now. So this is a paper that just came out in the Forester Chronicle a couple of months ago. It was called Re-examining Wood Supply in Light of Future Spruce Budworm Outbreaks, a case study in, in New Brunswick. So this is the spruce fir harvest level on this axis. And right now the projection is this gray line, no defoliation. So New Brunswick is expecting off their 2.8 million hectares of crown land 4 million cubic meters out to 2042, and then it's expected to step up to something over 5 million cubic meters as a result of silviculture, thinning and, and planting, and then it's expected to step up around 2062 to around something over 7 million cubic meters because of the, the multi-million dollar per year investment in planting and thinning that's going on. If we build budworm onto it, all these different other lines on here are, built, are different scenarios of budworm, and it drives it down. So the growing stock is going to be the outbreak happens for the first 10 years, but the effect on the growing stock continues on right after, and it means we don't get this step up at all, uh, and it finally catches up out here, except probably another outbreak would have happened by then. Um, so if we express this as the, as the cumulative spruce fir harvest reduction for those three different scenarios, it's of the order of kind of 15 to 25 percent reduction in the, in the expected harvest level with, with no management, no spraying, just let budworm do what it, what it would do. Now an alternative here is to think about, okay, what if we weren't going to spray any insecticide, but what if we were willing to change our planning? And just as an example, if we had two stands out there, we had a jack pine stand that's not susceptible to budworm that's scheduled for harvest in 2045, and we've got a balsam fir stand that is susceptible to budworm and it's going to be killed, it's scheduled for, for harvest uh, kind of in a, in a later time period, and we switch them around to get to the the, uh, the balsam first stand first, then the, there's, a, there's a gain. And it, we, we can do this in an optimization framework now in the timber supply model. Um, so this is the this third graph here is the, is the reduction in the cumulative harvest uh, with and without a planned salvage treatment and replanning of the. So it would essentially mean developing a new management plan with the express objective of minimizing the budworm caused losses. And it turns out that we can reduce the losses by probably 10 to 20 percent, purely by those changes in planning. Um, so that's one option, and I think it's feasible to do. Ten years ago, you couldn't have done that if you were in industry. You couldn't have turned around a management plan that fast. I think now it's starting to be feasible, given the, uh, the benefit of it. The next thing we could do would be consider spraying some insecticide on the area. So, so on this axis here, we've got the area protected as a percentage of the susceptible from zero on the left to 100 percent on the right. This is after 25 years and after, and after 50 years. And the value is the decrease in the cumulative wood supply reduction. So how much, how much are we pulling those dotted lines up closer to the expected lines? And this is showing, so if you're not doing any, any, uh, any protection, you're not uh, having any loss. But, and, and because of the ability of the decision support system to target those stands that are going to sustain the biggest losses, we're getting the biggest bang for the buck early here in the first 10 percent or 20 percent, and then this is leveling off, except on, on a long-term projection there's an effect. And if you remember the, the curves catching up to the projected increases, the step-ups, that's what's happening there. If you spray more area, you're, you're able to capture that. Um, so that's, that's one thing that we've uh, done a projection on. Next, we look at using those values to answer some socioeconomic questions, build some economic analysis. P PhD student at UMB 
named Wei Yu Chang, was supervised by, by Van Lance and, and myself, asked three questions in his project. The first was, what are the public attitudes towards forest pest control? And he did a survey of the public in New Brunswick and Saskatchewan and asked them questions about spruce budworm um, insecticide use and forest tent caterpillars insecticide use. And he came back with 80% of the public was supportive of control of future pest outbreaks and more than 90% was supportive for funding of research and development on, on pest control. His second question was about uh, what's the most efficient level of protection from an economic standpoint. Uh, this was a benefit cost analysis for all of the crown land in New Brunswick, the 2.8 million hectares. The scenarios were moderate and severe budworm outbreaks, um, protecting the peak years when defoliation was greater than 70%, protecting either none, 10%, 20%, or 40% of the land base, and, and looking at what's the wood product value, the aerial spray cost, the benefit cost ratio, and also trying to estimate the non-market um, benefits as well. Um, and this, there's a bunch of numbers on here. The, the key ones are kind of down here in yellow. The, the columns are, so this is a severe outbreak scenario, benefit cost analysis. The columns are the percentage of the susceptible area protected. 10% in this column, so this would be a 280,000 hectare spray program. 20% would be 568,000 hectares, 40% here. Uh, th this, the values down, these are the benefit cost ratios. So it's saying that including all the market values, you're getting 3.8 times the benefit if you spray 10% of the area. Uh, four, per four times the benefit of, as the cost if you, sp if you include the non-market value. This is, equates to $97 million more benefit than cost at spraying 10%. And it jumps, if you include the non-market values, the net present value jumps to 110 or so million spraying 20% of the area. So this gives some inkling that it, does it pay to spray? And this is saying, well, yeah, it does, about three to four times what it, what it would cost you. The third question is taking this from, from the direct effects on, on the economy to the indirect effects. Uh, and so this is taking the same information from the previous set of scenarios and, and integrating them with what's called a dynamic computable general equilibrium model of the economy in New Brunswick. All of the, the spin-off effects of the logging and the forestry and logging sector on all the rest of the economy if mills are shutting down or not, are not meeting their, their targets. And he's looking at things like output and employment and in trade, exports, and, and, and imports. Um, and the results are summarized in, in three slides here. And this is millions of dollars on this axis. They're all coming down because it's the, co the cost of the outbreak. Um, the green bar is a moderate outbreak, and the red one is a severe outbreak. Um, this set is no protection, 10% of the area protected, 20% and 40% of the area protected. And the values are about a billion dollars for the moderate outbreak and 1.3 or so billion dollars with a severe outbreak. And this is forestry and logging sector output, um, discounted at 4% over the 30-year period or so from 2012 to 2041. Um, and then if we expand this to the total economic output, including all sectors, the numbers jump to about $3 billion to $4.5 billion. Uh, with if there's no protection at all, and we can calculate sort of what's the what's the, the indirect benefits associated with the spray programs as well, and then the third thing was a translation into employment of person years, and it's of the order of uh, 10,000 person years of employment to 13,000 person years of employment associated with moderate and severe outbreaks coming and not doing anything. So, so this has been presented to the minister and deputy minister of natural resources to give them some help in making decisions about whether to protect or not to protect. The, the second aspect of, of this is looking at budworm, not in terms of the economic effects, but what about where it fits in the ecology? Can we, what, what about spruce budworm inspired management of balsam fir forests? And this doesn't necessarily mean, well, balsam fir is, it's all killed in an outbreak, but how can, if, if we move our harvesting towards what budworm would do, then what kind of forest are we going to end up with? And Iris Spence did her master's with me on, on this. It was published in a couple of papers. The, the general I idea here is that natural disturbance-based management uses data about the historical natural disturbance and the natural range of variation. And I guess we also have to consider climate change and what's going to happen in the future with this. But the idea is to create forest management plans that emulate the spatial and temporal ranges of past disturbance. And this deals with concerns about maintaining ecological functions and biodiversity values in, in managed forest. And essentially, it was a comparison of a trial of a new way of, of, of cutting 
um, that was only a, a trial and comparison with how that compared with the pictures down here are an actual stand that was killed by budworm on Cape Breton Island, the same plot in 1979 and 89 um, that was 87% killed. So the idea here, the, th this was applied by J.D. Irving Limited in, on their private land in northern New Brunswick, over 2,700 hectares. The prescription was to cut every 9 out of 10 mature balsam fir, cut 6 out of 10 of every mature spruce. Um, leave, the leaf trees were selected to be most wind firm and vigorous, and all non-host species uh, were left except they were, unless they were located in the harvest trail. So here, it's, it's variable retention, but the, the variation is dependent upon the species composition of the forest rather than on a, a prescription, per se. Uh, what did we learn, learn from this? And Irving was interested in, in doing this. Uh, uh, one thing we found, so on here, this is the, is the comparison of uh, the percent of the predisturbance stand density. Uh, with the green line, if you can see it, being the natural spruce budworm outbreak, and there's a yellow line if it's visible on here with, the, with this budworm emulation harvest treatment going on. And th this ended up being a little bit different because it was more hardwoods in the, in the Irving stands in, in northern New Brunswick. The budworm mortality or happened over mainly over about four years or so. The harvest treatment was implemented over four years, so that was kind of similar. But after the harvest treatment, we got some blowdown to a larger influence than, th there was a larger influence than in the budworm outbreak that you would kind of expect with that level of treatment. It's shown in, in this graph here. So this is the percentage of the post-disturbance stand density with the harvest treatment up here and the budworm outbreak down here. And this is the rate of blowdown. The different colors just represent whether it was, was uh, uprooting or stem breakage or, or crown breakage. But this goes up to about 40% of what was left over. So there was quite a lot of blowdown that happened. Whereas in the natural budworm outbreak, it was only about 8% or so. So if we were going to do this again, we'd alter the prescription to try to take in that into account and cut less with the idea that some's going to blow down anyway. So part of the idea of this was, uh, uh, what was can we learn something about bud, what budworm does? So if you're not interested in budworm, I'm switching topics now. I'm going to talk about greenhouse gas balance uh, for a forest company operating in northeastern North America. This was, was based on J.D. Irving stuff. We've got a paper that's coming out in the Journal of Forestry in the next few issues. We've got the proofs for it. Um, and the idea here was to look at greenhouse gas emissions and carbon stocks. So the carbon that's in the forest, but also the carbon that goes out with the mills and with the products and with the operations. Now, Irving um, owns or manages 2.2 million hectares uh, in Maine and New Brunswick and, and, and Nova Scotia. Um, the dark green on here is what they own. It's their freehold. This is the state of Maine over here. There's big chunks over there, these, these chunks. The light green, if you can see them, is the crown land. So 1.2 million hectares of freehold and 1 million hectares of, of crown. They operate a dozen or so um, sawmills, um, some spruce fir sawmills, hardwood, pine, cedar, five pulp and paper mills or, or tissue mills, um, some seed orchards, and and, and nurseries sprinkled throughout the region, a couple of mills, that one's down in New York and one's up in Toronto for producing uh, other material. Um, and they track everything in their company. They track the liters of gasoline that are used, the electricity that's purchased, what goes into a mill, what goes out of a mill, what goes into boilers and that. And so all of this was built into, was converted into carbon and emissions. And, and a postdoc and a master's student worked on this for, for two years to, to track both the, the, the carbon that's in the forest, in wooden paper products, the forest operations emissions, the sawmills, the pulp mills, the purchased electricity, um, all fuel that was used, um, the potential substitution benefits if you weren't going to harvest and you had to substitute um, steel studs or concrete instead of wood products, and what about alternative management strategies? And, and this was, uh, was done as a 100-year projection um, using the forest estate model, baseline planned harvest and, and silviculture. Um, and you might ask, well, why was the company interested in doing this? And I guess because they see value in carbon and they want to know what their operations are, are doing to it. So the, the general idea of this is we're including both what happens with stands as they grow um, through stand growth models and timber supply models uh, and management operations. We're converting this into carbon in the forest that's in live biomass and in dead organic matter and the biomass of harvest residues. 
Um, we're looking at the forest products that come off of the land, the lumber and the paper, and what, what's the life cycle of that, and, and how long before, on average, it ends up in a landfill? How long does it stay in landfill? How much of that methane comes off? And what would be the uh, avoided emissions? And then, and then last of all, we're looking at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with uh, the on-site, the uh, uh, trucks and harvesting machinery, uh, planting a seedling, driving planting crews out, nursery production, um, the upstream is purchased electricity. What's the carbon that goes into that? The downstream is the secondary manufacturing of stuff that Irving doesn't do themselves, and the landfill carbon emissions. So there's a lot of stuff that's wrapped up in here. Um, I'm going to show you just kind of a couple of series of, of, of outputs from this. And one is just where are the emissions uh, relative to different kinds of things that happen in the forest. So, so this is emissions in terms of tons of CO2 equivalent per cubic meter of harvested material. And there's a bunch of really small values along here. The one on the very left is silviculture. You can hardly see it. Road operations, floating, kind of moving, moving equipment on, on trucks from one place to another. Trucking, so harvest, moving the stuff out of the wood to a mill or moving the uh, uh, milled material to the market. Um, harvesting, so we're starting to see the trucking and the harvesting values. Sawmills is also quite a low value. The yellow is the upstream, which think of that as the purchased electricity or the fuel um, that's used by a truck, diesel or gasoline. And, and then the on-site emissions in green are, are what's actually burned in that, through that process. The big one by far over here is the pulp and paper mills. And the biggest part of it is the yellow part, the upstream, um, so the purchased electricity used by some of these pulp mills is, is really high. And the thing about this, it matters where you are. What kind of, like, from a carbon standpoint, it matters How's your electricity being produced if you're using a lot of it? So this value is based on the New Brunswick average, um, and there's quite a bit of fossil fuel used to produce that electricity. The Canadian average would pull this value down to here. The Quebec average, where there's a lot of hydroelectricity produced, if Irving had their mills in, in, uh, in Quebec, um, the value would be down here. If their mills in, were in Alberta, it would be up here. It would kind of, I'm mean, not to be say it's good or bad, but it's just the way it is. And if you're trying to think about carbon credits and things like that, it makes a difference if you're, if you're including everything, not just what's in the forest there. Um, and I guess that's kind of one of the take home messages from this analysis. There's lots of things you've got to include if you want to have a meaningful analysis here. The second thing I wanted to show you is the forest level carbon storage change over 100 years projection um, as a result of the 100 year management strategy. So this is the cumulative pool change from 2010 over here to uh, 20 to one one, 2110, kind of over here, 100 years. Um, and the zero value is where we are currently. And where we are is 650 megatons of carbon, CO2 equivalent stored in the forest. So we're looking at the change from that, from that baseline point. And negative values are storage or removal, good and positive values are emissions, and I want to look at the influence of a bunch of different things. So this is showing that the, the forest is going to grow, um, and it's always going to stay more than it is right now based on, on their projections. And this includes two big step-ups of harvest level kind of over that time period that I'll talk about in a minute. Next, what if we look at the products that are produced from that forest? The solid wood products in here, uh, and the uh, paper products with the bluish color, and the paper and solid wood products as they get no longer used and they get transferred into landfills. And you think about how long a piece of paper stays in use, not very long before it goes in the, re some of it may go to recycling, but a lot of it goes to landfills. And uh, the projections on this were all based on kind of US national um, rates of, of transfer in the life cycle analysis. And then we consider, so, the, so with this, there's a mean annual sequestration of 1.37 megatons of CO2 uh, equivalent uh, per year, uh, seven, which would be 7% of New Brunswick overall emissions. Next, if we consider the emissions from that that are, are, are going into the production of those products, um, the upstream is the purchased electricity, the downstream is transport and secondary manufacturing, the on-site forest operations are right here, the on-site milling and the landfill methane is here. And the dotted line that's on here is the net. So this is the what's happening with the storage down here minus what's happening with the emissions and we end up with this pattern and it's it's uh, uh, a, a net removal kind of up until the very end here and then it's changing um, and the next thing we looked at is okay 
if we change some things in the system, how would they influence that pattern over time? And one of the things is, is landfill methane capture. Um, it, it's, it's increasing all the time. Right now, and so there's a projection in the literature saying that there's going to be an increase in landfill capture. The, the current projection assumes 49% of landfills have methane capture in them. And the projection is that by 2040, it's going to be 90%. And with just that change, if you build it into it, it, it almost makes this a, a, a net storage value here. The second one is, well, what if there was hydroelectricity generation? If, it, if the mills were in a different place, we'd end up down here. I mean, this could never happen for Irving specifically, but it, it's a what if. Um, what if 100% of the pulp mill, pulp wood, wasn't used for paper production? What if it was used for uh, bioenergy production with the same harvest levels? We'd be way down here or something. And, and remember, the, these values, these negative values are storage of, of carbon that's being not put into the, into the atmosphere. Okay? So it starts to see what are, what are the important factors. And I guess the conclusions from this part of the talk are that from 2010 to 2015, the total emissions for 21% from forest operations, 4% from sawmills, and 75% from pulp and paper mills. And, and the sawmill values are so low because of, of uh, incorporation of boilers and using waste material to produce electricity and defray the cost of purchased electricity. Um, secondly, the forest and products, net greenhouse gas, the sequestration minus emissions, a sink of about 30 tons of CO2 per hectare in year 50. As the harvest levels increased, the emissions were greater than sequestration by year 85, and there was a greenhouse gas source of about six tons of CO2 per hectare by year 100. But this includes softwood harvest increases of 23% in 2045 and of 50% in, in 2070. Um, and if those harvests were scaled back, then, the, then the, those values would change as well. Paper has a high energy and, and emissions in manufacturing, a short in-life use and large emissions from landfill. So it's a, it's a, a, a negative influence on, on carbon um, projections. Um, you gotta consider the disturbance risk associated with having carbon held in forest. Is a mountain pan, pine beetle outbreak gonna happen to your forest or a budworm outbreak or a fire or something like that? Um, you have to consider what products paper versus, versus solid. And you have to consider these grid electricity emissions it's a, it, if you're really taking a holistic view of, of carbon. Um, so here, kind of one of the conclusions here was that intensive forest management, like Irving is doing it, may result in similar greenhouse gas mitigation potential as allowing forests to grow unmanaged while providing forest products that produce societal benefits, depending upon kind of harvest rates and, and what you include in the, in the equation. Thirdly, forest zoning. Uh, different from an integrated approach, where in an integrated approach you'd manage to provide both timber and non-timber values on most hectares of the, of the forest. But with a, a zoning approach, you provide both timber and non-timber values, but at different locations. Specialized management for different values in separate portions of the forest. The idea here is you could increase the area in reserve, setting them aside, not manage them, but mitigate the loss production with, with an increased intensity of management somewhere else, and then have an integrated approach on, on the remaining, the, the third part. Um, and this has been called a triad approach by Seymour and Hunter. And The theory of forest zoning goes way back, and Clausen in the 1970s had talked about this, and a number of people have written about, about zoning approaches. But the term triad has been, was coined by Seymour and Hunter, who are from Maine. Um, and one of the important things, they talk about zoning reserves and intensively management within a landscape, and this is a key, a landscape managed with natural disturbance inspired silviculture. So it's not too far away from the way that, that uh, forests would, would uh, function naturally. Um, and the idea here is to, uh, you're assigning values to specific sections of the forest. Uh, that and this will protect all values over the entire area. So this is, if this is intensive management and this is a an old growth reserve that's not managed at all, and this is a more extensive management. Part of the question is, okay, how much of each, and where do we put them, and what values do you get from them, and what are the costs associated with it? So I wanted to describe a, a study that was a master study by Chris Ward. Who, he took a crown license in New Brunswick, in northern New Brunswick, about 400,000 hectares in the far northern part of the, of the province, and he did some, some zoning scenarios. He varied three things, kind of how much reserve area there is. This is the current reserve in that land base, in, shown in red. And he said, what if it's 5% or what if it's 13% or what if it's 22%? And what if the reserves are in small blocks or in large blocks? What would that do? 
And the second thing he varied is the area in plantation, also three levels, 12%, 17%, or 23%. And then the third thing he looked at was what are the harvest treatments? How are they conducted? Is it the way we currently harvest in New Brunswick? Or what about changing to a natural disturbance-based harvest treatment? Um, so this just gives a visual picture of the, what 13% of the of uh, reserve areas in red, in small blocks and in large blocks, or 22%. Uh, so, so these are identified on particular areas for particular reasons uh, in terms of representativeness, of representing different uh, types of forests that are there and the age classes and, and that. And the large blocks, the theory behind this would be that larger and rounder is better. And these were taking whole map sheets of, of, uh, of forests and moving them out, out of production and, and into something else. And then with plantations, the, the, the targets with this were based on targeting an area at year 50, locating them on rich sites, um, and uh, with either a 25% increase in current levels of planting, which would result in 17%, and this was paired with 13% reserves, or a 50% increase in planting, which would result in 23%, and this was paired with 22% reserves. Uh, and Chris's results are, are shown in this format, and I'm going to have a series of slides like this to show you, so I want to explain it first. This is in millions of cubic meters of, of spruce fir, jack pine, softwood harvest, and hardwood harvest combined. It's going to be along this axis. And these are our, our scenarios across here. So the 13% in small blocks and large blocks, the status quo, the 22% in small blocks and large blocks, the status quo harvest treatments, and the natural disturbance space ones over on, on this side, a set of four. And there's just going to be bars that appear. So if we look at what's this going to do to production over the first 25 years, because the, the short-term effects and the long-term effects are different, and you have to look at them separately. So this is showing that the uh, status quo, the current is like 0 0.75, 750,000 cubic meters per year. And the small blocks ends up a little bit less than, or a little bit more than that. So the, the, as, as there's greater allocation to reserve, kind of moving towards the 22%, the values are, are going down, uh, 97 and 89 versus 100 over here. There's a greater short-term reduction, okay? Um, if the, air, if the reserve area is taken from the general forest, uh, there's a greater short-term reduction that occurs. So 97 versus which is 102 or, or 89. The, if we look at the natural disturbance-based, uh, it results in about an 8% decrease in the short-term harvest level. So instead of 102, it's, it's 94 there. So we can quantify sort of the different levers that there are in the system here. The second, the yellow bars alongside the red ones are looking at the longer term, year 26 to, to 100. So we're doing things now, but it takes a while for the trees to grow up to be able to produce anything. So we're seeing larger increases here, up to like 33%, but it's over the long term. It's not over the, it's not over the short term. So if you set something up like this, you're going to have to be willing to wait for the, the result of it to come. With the greater investment in planting, there's a greater long-term harvest by kind of a quarter to a third. Um, and then the white bars average over the full hundred years here. Uh, with we, we can increase the reserves and maintain the average, average harvest level. There's three different examples on here where the white bar is right around 800,000 cubic meters. The status quo, um, a little bit more here with the large blocks with 22% or the small blocks with 13% and natural disturbance ones are all about the same long-term values, but they've got some different short-term and long-term implications of that too. So to look at this another way, we've got this, or th this, is, this graph is kind of like a contour map. So it's showing the percentage of the forest allocated to reserve zone on this axis from 10% up to 35%, and the percentage of the forest allocated to the intensive zone on this axis from 10% to 35%. And the contours, if you could read the numbers on them, they read the 100-year average spruce fir jack pine harvest. So there's what contour here that is 600,000 cubic meters of spruce fir jack pine forest. The other 200,000 would have been hardwood forest. And there's three different points on here which have different levels of intensive and reserve areas. So three scenarios that each produce the same value are 10% reserves and 70% extensive and 20% intensive, or 20% reserves and 25% intensive, it's the same, or 25% reserves and 35% intensive would all get you sort of the same production. So do you want 10% of the forest set aside in reserves or do you want 25% set aside in reserves? If you're willing to make up that production using intensive management, you can have either 
there. But there's a, there's a time dimension to this as well. If we look at the harvest level over, over time, remember the short term versus long term, that there's a, a cost associated with being up here. Um, the short term harvest is going to go down um, in that time period, and that's something to, uh, to consider here. So just to sum up this, um, the advantages of triad to the conservation of the managed forest landscapes, we can increase the protected areas without reducing the timber production. Um, better ecosystem-based management of the largest forest zone, the matrix within which protected areas, intensively managed areas are located, that could be the biggest benefit of this. And now that would mandate that you had to follow this idea of natural disturbance-based silviculture on the matrix forest in there. Um, and one interesting thing is that nearly everybody agrees with two-thirds of the triad, but it's not the same two-thirds. Some people like the idea of intensive management and extensive and hate the idea of reserves. Why would you set them aside? Other people like the idea of extensive management and reserves, but hate the idea of any intensive management out there. Um, scenario planning can identify the trade-offs. and. I, we've got to decide on the appropriate mix of values, but I think it is possible to link those two together and make more people happy with it in terms of uh, linking the area of reserve with the intensive management to have more of uh, a both. Lastly, coming down the home stretch here, kind of fourth out of four, and then one more little topic. This is an experimental manipulation that we've got going in northern New Brunswick that I thought might be of interest. We're in year three of five of this. And the idea here is, can you modify intensive forest management for conservation purposes? Irving in their spruce plantations at around year 20 to 30 does a commercial thin where they go in. And I'll show you some pictures of this in, in a minute. And we're focusing on taxa with a clear connection to deadwood and thinning response. And this is, these, these are looking at the effect on beetles and mosses and bird species that are dependent upon deadwood, because there's usually not much there in these, in these young plantations looking at vegetation species sensitive to disturbance, looking at small mammals with low density and planted stands. The experimental design was to pick 20, six 25 hectare plantations that were about 25 to 30 years old that hadn't been thinned yet. Um, and they're the ones that are shown on the, on the map here. Um, divide each of them up into four blocks. Um, establish a network of 120 permanent sample plots uh, throughout these areas before we did anything. And then apply four treatments. And the first treatment was an unthinned. It's, it's the control for comparison. So this is what these spruce plantations look like. The second one is the, su is the status quo commercial thinning. So they cut trails, and then they use a small single grip harvester down here to reach in in between the, the trails to thin, thin trees out. Um, so we can see the sort of the biomass, the fine woody debris that's left after. Um, and forwarder is used to take, it's relatively small wood, but it is a commercial thinning. They're using all of this, uh, putting it through mills. Our third, our third treatment was emulating what happened if we ever got re into a really intensive biomass use. And we decided we wanted to use not only the stems for producing um, two by fours, and Irving runs a line in their mill that produces two by twos as well, if you're thinking of how small you can use these. But what if we took the branches and tops off as well, and we're going to produce them, put them to a biomass plant? Um, and this was a what if. Nobody's in, planning on doing that right now, but that was push things the other way. Um, and then the fourth one was in the other direction. We called it an enhanced structure treatment. We left some unthinned clumps within the stands, uh, kind of like this. The, they were ribboned off ahead of time before the thinning was done. The trees weren't thinned in them. And then we got the company to agree to let us go in and girdle half the trees, kill them, strip the bark off. Hard to believe kind of that we're doing this to a planted tree out there. Um, in 2011, and the idea was to girdle half the trees in one period and wait two or three years for the remaining ones to get a little bigger. And the idea here was to create snags and to see how species are reacting to them, those that need standing deadwood because there's not much in there otherwise. There's six grad student projects at University of New Brunswick and University of Moncton that are ongoing. Some, none are completed yet, one's almost complete. The first is looking at stand growth and, and light and photosynthesis. Kwajo Almari is a PhD student working with me. The second one is looking at small rodents, doing trapping of them. Evan Dracup is doing his master's at, at UMB on this. Third is looking at mosses and ground vegetation. Sean Hoyen, uh, his PhD, working with Kate Frigo at UMB St. John. Fourth, Allison McKay is looking at bird species um, use of, 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 of these plantations. And then two are working with Gaetan Moreau at University of Moncton. They both deal with beetles, saprozoic beetles' response to commercial thinning in, in deadwood on Paris Nadeau. And Frank Gandiaga is looking at the quality of deadwood, the age and the type of wood, and also the surrounding forest type. 
uh, the type of forest management and the vegetation that goes on. And these studies are still ongoing, but I'm going to, uh, they're supported by an NSERC Collaborative Research and Development Grant for, for five years. I've got a little bit of data to show you from them. The Kwaju Amari was, was the student who established all these 120 permanent sample plots. And even though these were planted, this is just the species composition before thinning. So they were between 70 to 100 percent spruce, but up to 30 percent fir in some of the plots. That's the green. It's in here. And up to 15 percent hardwood of aspen and birch and maple. Those are the volunteer ones that, that come in anyways. And he's looking, he's tracking the down deadwood and the snags um, that are occurring and how did they change with the, with the treatments that went on. We know that the, the thinning treatment is producing all kinds of fine deadwood, but what happens with the, the down deadwood, the, the old stuff that's been there? So the volume in terms of cubic meters per hectare was sort of around 20 to 30 cubic meters, but there was a little, a little addition of down deadwood with the, with the thinning treatment. Um, some snags were added and, and some were lost during the commercial thinning, not a whole lot of, of change right there. The girdled trees in terms of their contribution is relatively low in terms of cubic meters per hectare because the trees weren't, weren't very big, but we've categorized sort of these three different categories of down deadwood snags that are going to create down deadwood when they ever they fall over and then these girdled trees that are, that are essentially attractants for beetles or birds that need standing deadwood. Uh, okay. The small rodent experiment with, with Evan Dracup, his experimental design was to, to look at the influence across these treatment types of what's the influence of uh, plants as both shelter and food because there's several different levels of, of plants. Lowest in, in the control, these cl canopies are pretty closed so there's not much light that's getting down, not many plants under them. The biomass removal commercial thin had the highest plant cover and then the status quo commercial thin and the, the uh, enhanced structure one were medium. Second was the fine deadwood. Um, a number of the small rodent species need uh, cover from this, um, low and high, depending upon whether it was the biomass removal or control versus the, the thinned ones. And the third one was, was fruit, food supply. Um, and this one, he actually had an added fruit treatment in the enhanced. He put, he put berries out um, to see if, if the populations would respond to those. But again, it was low in the, in the control and medium. So this was the design and then he's looking for, for what happened. He, he's using what's called mark recapture trapping. He puts out a, a trapping grid uh, with 100 traps, uh, 10 by 10 meter spacing. Um, he traps five days in each plantations in the spring and summer of 2011 and 2012. This was 25,000 trap nights and 368 rodents caught. And when he captures them, they were live traps that they, they go in, he, he would weigh them, he'd sex them, and he'd put an ear, ear tag on and let them go. And then some of them would come back and get caught again in the trap over and over over again. So what he's founding, finding results just for two of the species, uh, southern redback vole, kind of this, this one up here. This is the density per hectare of them. With this one, he was finding a difference, that with plentiful dead wood in the status quo commercial thinning and the enhanced and added food commercial thinning, the values were higher that with them was scarce dead wood, the unthinned and the biomass removal here. And there's significant differences between, between the density of, of those two. So dead wood availability was restricting the, the vole populations. Uh, the other species that he looked at was different, uh, woodland jumping mouse. Um, with it, the non-commercially thinned area, the control one, was different than all three of the commercially thinned ones had lower numbers in them. So commercial thinning was having a negative impact on the jumping mice over the fir this first two years after the treatment. Another question would be how long is this going to last? Uh, mosses and, and ground vegetation, the response of them, that the, the concern here is that bryophytes, the moss species that are, are sensitive to disturbance and are dependent upon coarse woody debris, um, might have a negative effect to the, to the thinning. Understory vascular plants were of interest as potential indicator species. And Sean is doing a bunch of things related to bryophyte growth experiments and, and uh, microclimatic measurement and diversity modeling. And his main hypothesis is that understory humidity is the main control of the epizylic bryophyte community. Um, but he's also been monitoring the vascular plants. Uh, so this is the mean, mean percent cover of the different treatments across here in year one or, or year two where the colors just represent different groups of plants, the forbs or grasses or shrubs or, or trees. And he's found kind of 204 total species, more than 50 species of bryophytes. Um, but the total cover was increasing by about 50% in year two over year one in all of the thin, the thin treatments. So more light is coming in and the plants are responding to that. 
Uh, with birds, Alison McKay, she, she identified certain species of birds that are, are dependent upon either woody debris or uprooted trees and large stumps and well-decayed snags uh, within the stand and is, is looking at sort of how, how, uh, how the treatment is influencing them. I don't have any data from, from Allison here. Got just a little bit on the saprophilic beetles, the beetles that require dead wood. Um, these were sampled using these flight intercept traps. It's essentially a piece of plexiglass with a funnel down below and the, and the beetles fly in and hit this and bounce down and end up in the, the cup down here. Uh, and the, the traps were set up in a, in a line 5, 15, 30, 60, and 120 meters from the road down kind of one of these thin trails. Traps were emptied every two weeks in, through June and, and August, 135 traps in the Black Brook District. And in addition to the plantations in this study, they were doing some trapping in some old growth coniferous reserves up here. Found a tremendous number of beetles. Um, Got to give my sympathy to the students that are identifying all of these 60,000 individual beetles caught. 48 families, 208 species, seven new species to New Brunswick, one rare new species to Atlantic Canada. As soon as you start looking for these things in detail, you find new things that are, that are out there. The preliminary results from, from Paris, um, so this is the beetle, beetle capture per trap as a function of distance from the road. Um, more beetles in the commercial thin in the reserves than in the unthinned, kind of down here, quite a strong separation. And a tendency to be more adjacent to the road, the closer to the road, and farther from the road. And we're not quite sure what's going on with that, but there seemed to be, a, at least for several of the, the traps, a pattern of that. Uh, so I wanted to end up here just about effective university industry collaboration. Um, and we've worked with this J.D. Irving Limited Forest Research Advisory Committee. And we did a lot of work when the Sustainable Forest Management Network was going on out here, and we received great support from, from that network. Um, and, but the Forest Research Advisory Committee that Irving established was founded in 1998 and it was a product at that time they were seeking Forest Stewardship Council certification audits and the, the auditors came in and, and they said look you're doing a whole lot of stuff on your landscape here and you really should be looking at scientifically what, what you're doing to a variety of different taxa. So they agreed to set up this committee and it includes some professors from University of New Brunswick and University of Moncton and University of Maine from the scientists from the Cons Manomet Conservation Center in Maine, from the New Brunswick Department of Natural Resources, and, and Gordon Baskerville was the original kind of leader of, of, of this committee. Um, and his, he established sort of the, the raison d'etre of it was, was to empower the forest manager. This became the mantra, not to, not to supplant, not to provide decisions, but to provide information to help make decisions uh, as a decision maker. Um, it's an active partnership of researchers and, and forest managers. Uh, I think the EMAN project out here is kind of another active partnership between University of Alberta and, and everyone who's involved in DMI and CANFOR. That's another great example. Um, but I think what's, wh what's important about this is the active nature of it. So we seek co-funding together. There have been 31 grad student projects at the two universities uh, funded through this. There's biannual meetings and the grad students attend these meetings and they present on their projects and they get feedback from them and they definitely get a lot of value from presenting to these real world hard nosed forest managers. There's research quality through peer reviewed publications. The, the managers are involved in products, project selection and design and, and proposals. They put funding, the company puts funding towards projects but they want to get leverage and they, wanna, they, want, they want you to find other f sources of funding to, to match those. Um, but I think this active monitoring and evaluation of research project progress. So quite often there would be a company person as a, as a, a graduate student, not official committee member, but an unofficial committee member that would attend all of their committee meetings and things like that. Uh, I think one of the main results of this is two-way learning and education. I figure this, the professors and students and scientists learn as much from the, the forest managers as, as vice versa. It's two-way, back and forth. Uh, the company capacity for uptake of results has changed. Job descriptions within the company and responsibilities have changed um, as a result of this. To, to, and it provides a, a means of, 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 of uptake and essentially an investment of more than just dollars. Uh, so there's an investment of time as well as dollars. Um, and in terms of the, the questions that are of interest to the Forest Research Advisory Committee, one of them is this, how do intensively managed stands contribute to habitat and biodiversity or how could they? 
um, this experimental manipulation study that I've just showed you. What role do mixed wood stands play in terms of diversity in, in habitat? The mixtures of, of uh, deciduous and evergreen species mixed together. Forest management in New Brunswick tends to take these mixed wood stands and push them one way or the other towards a softwood type or towards a hardwood type. And it's not complete. There's a cost associated with the mixed wood management, but it also seems like there's a value. And we're trying to quantify what that would be. The third one, they've been interested in natural disturbance regimes. And what, what does budworm do just on, in terms of product, in other insects, in terms of production, but also how would forests function if we weren't there doing anything to it? And the fourth one is what's the importance of context within which stands occur throughout the landscape? How much does it matter what's next to a particular stand? Do you have to do something on every hectare, or if you're kind of within 500 meters or a kilometer of something else, is that good enough? Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of outputs, um, one of the things that the company likes to do that I thought might be of interest is, is they produce these panels of summing up the results of grad student projects and they put them in their district offices and the guidelines for them are, well, no scientific graphs, we don't want them on them. We want 500 words, uh, we want it to be like nice pictures to, to show things that people will be interested in and, and the content, the, the company asks, uh, what is the question, um, what was done, what was found, what does it mean? Kind of sum up those things in, in five words, which are 500 words or so. And these have been quite successful. And they put these out from in a public environment as well. They package them up as well. Um, so just in my last slide here, I know, thanks for bearing with me all this time. Um, conclusions, remember the changing context for sustainable forest management in the urban scorekeeper. Um, credibility, communication, proof of performance. We should be able to justify what we're doing uh, and why it's important to do it and why it makes sense to do it and what, what are the influences on a whole variety of different elements of ecosystems out there. Understanding the ecology of our forest treatments. We can use planning to reduce insect impacts. Uh, we can also look at natural disturbance-based silviculture and the relation to habitat. We can look at how intensive management affects sensitive taxa. And there are going to be new values like carbon coming online. Uh, so it's not just volume productions. We can adapt those models for a variety of things. Forest zoning, I think, is a possible approach. I'll leave that with you. Intensive, extensive, and protected. Specialized management in separate portions of the, of the forest as opposed to trying to do everything everywhere. And I think that linking intensively managed and protected forests towards meeting agreed upon production and conservation goals may well be a viable way forward. Um, I'd like to acknowledge kind of all the grad students and colleagues and funders and collaborators that have worked on here. Here's a list of the 31 grad students that I haven't supervised them all. A variety of professors at UMB and, and at University of Moncton have. Um, Greg Adams, Gaetan Pelche, John Gilbert, and, and Pam Hurley Poitra have been the, the main company staff that have been involved with this effort. Um, and as well as my collaborators and many student field assistants. We were running a field camp with uh, 16 grad students and assistants last summer, um, kind of up in St. Leonard. So with that, thank you.